So um, my name's Tracy Newman. I'm based in medicine, um, although my group are based over in Building 85 because I tend to work with people outside of medicine as, as well as people within it. And I think one point just to pick up on from that last question that came up it, that might be of interest to you, so there has been work done uh, in Mexico City in particular where street dogs have been picked up at various points and been analysed to see whether or not they show any evidence of accumulation. And there's actually evidence of accumulation of particulates within their forebrains. So the particulates seem to have the ability to access, to gain direct access to the central nervous system. And that's something that kind of relates to the work that we're doing, although our system, as you will see, is not mammalian. So I need you to hang on to a few of the things that Matt has kind of elegantly introduced. The particulate component of pollution is really important to consider. The bit he didn't maybe touch on quite so much is the gaseous component. And at least part of that, all of you will be familiar with, because it's one of the things that the mainstream media have been excited about quite a lot at various points in the context of so-called greenhouse gases. So a major component of exhaust emissions of all sorts of sources, you know, whether it's power stations, car exhausts, are things like carbon dioxide. In addition to that, just touching on the kind of reactive chemistry <coughs> end of it, the other two sets of gaseous compounds that are really important to consider are the nitric oxides and the sulfur oxides. They're very, very reactive molecules, and much of what Matt has talked about in the context of having metal particles, airborne metal particles, being able to induce cellular stress responses, nitric oxides in particular have that capacity. And what, one of the things I want to talk to you about is that in a slightly different context, in a slightly different biological system. The other thing I think it's worth bearing in mind is that it's worth contemplating for a second what is a smog event. Sorry, I'm being strangled by my microphone. Um, and really, a smog event is an illustration at its simplest of poorer ventilation. So you have a period where, because of the atmospheric conditions, pollutants that are in that environment anyway are effectively captured to some extent, and you get to see build up. So what you're looking at here, and it, I think Matt picked up this picture of well of Paris recently. This is London about two weeks ago as well, when we had that first patch of warm weather. So this is very current, and these are two cities that, again, have had quite a lot of publicity, along with other cities around the world, because of the real drive to try and actually reduce driving. So Paris have recently switched to a system where you can only go into the city on alternate days, depending on registration plates. And, of course, in London, we're now nearly 10 years into having the congestion charge. And while cynically you might see the congestion charge as another way of generating revenue, one of the real aims behind that was to drive down the level of airborne pollution in the city as well as to try and facilitate movement within the city. And if you look at the figures from there are many, many monitoring sites which you can access on the web and just look at it on a daily basis. Actually, the current levels of pollution in London broadly are much lower than they were before the introduction of the con congestion charge. There's also probably somewhere in the region of 60,000 vehicle movements less per day. So it has had an impact. And part of that is being driven really by human health. There's been a lot of um, work coming out recently, as Matt had just touched on, on really starting to explore in more detail the cardiovascular impacts. Because in, in terms of some of those sudden incre increases in sudden deaths that Matt touched on, some of those will be as a result of cardiovascular episodes. So stroke rates go up after smog incidents. You also have, and that's normally because you have... Um, increased vascular events after um, smog events. What I want to go on to, though, is to kind of think slightly beyond what you might think of straightforwardly as human health and what else is living alongside us that might also be being affected by what you're looking at here. And that's the impact of Im what we've chosen to work on in particular is the impact of diesel exhaust. And I'll try and say why we've homed in on that bit on a key insect species. Now we've chosen to work on the honeybee, which is what you can see in this left-hand picture here. So you can see a honeybee forager. We know it's a forager because if you look at this leg here, you can see a yellow aggrega aggregation. That's the pollen sac. So that bee has been out actively picking up pollen from plants, stashing them onto its leg to then take back to the hive. Now the health of the hive relies in big part on these animals being able to forage effectively. I want to want, what I want to try and talk you through is how airborne pollutants may be impacting on the efficiency of these animals. And I should say as well at this point, and I'll touch on it again at the end, we're using the honeybee 
but I think you need to think beyond the honeybee. This is just one insect that we can conveniently work with. There are many, many other insect species working in a similar environment with similar stressors on them, if you like, that may also be affected. So this was just a, you know, one of the things when you're working with these animals, you get a chance to look at them in different ways, and this might be the way that some of you you know, the, your awareness of honeybees may be particularly around this bit of them. This is actually the sting of a bee under the electron microscope. Now, when a bee stings, it commits. They don't survive stinging you. And that's what these little serrated edges here actually hold the sting inside whatever it's attacked and stung. Now, normally they would sting to defend the hive. That's the most likely scenario. And what I'll, I'll show you now is a little bit of video to try and give you an idea of what life is like in honeybee world, or at least in one bit of honeybee world, and how forager activity um, works. So I just need to come out of here. So just to kind of give you some context to this and to let you know what you're looking at. We have two different apiary sites. We have an apiary site at Highfield, and we have a second, more rural site up at Chilworth. So we maintain hives in both of those sites uh, for experimental work. What you're looking at here is one of our experimental hives over the summer where the bees have actually been put into a situation where we're able to, for periods, control what they're exposed to. So we have hives that we set up where we can expose them chronically to diesel exhaust or just to ordinary ambient air, depending which hive the bees happen to be in. And then what you're actually seeing, so this is a sadly slightly badly cut plastic box that we use to contain the environment around the bees. And you can see the bees just standing on this little platform here. What they're actually doing, and one of the things that we're able to do, and the nice thing about why bother working with something as complex as a bee living out in the wild, is that we can actually engineer all sorts of devices to capture data about just what's going on in the daily activity and life of the bee. So what you're seeing is this little platform on the front where the bees land, then you can just make out these little gates effectively. What we then have is an electronic bee counter that looks like this, that plugs onto the hive. The bees land on the platform, they then get counted in and out. So there's electronics built into here on this chip that means on a daily basis, on a 24 hour basis, we can monitor their in and out behavior. Now, we know broadly what bees do. We know they go out to the toilet at a particular time of the day. We know they forage at particular times of the day. We should also be able to predict, depending on the weather, um, when they're likely to come out, when they're likely to stay in. They don't like the cold. They don't like the wet. So they tend to stay in in both of those situations. This is very dark for some reason. So what I want you to watch out for, there's a forager coming in. So you'll see just normal activity of the bees moving out and in. And then one of the things you'll see as the video pans on is actually one of the threats that these animals have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So this uh, hive is actually one that's situated up at Chilworth. So they're in that kind of on the edge of a very urban environment, but with quite a lot of rural space. And what you'll notice is most of the bees have these pointy abdomens. This is all the females. They'll be the workers and foragers going out to bring back pollen and nectar. The majority of the hive do not go out and forage. Only a subset of the hive are dedicated to that particular job, and they do it on a kind of rolling program. So a forager will maybe forage for a couple of weeks. It will then die. New young bees coming through will move on from being nurse bees to eventually going out and acting as forager bees. In amongst them, you'll also notice some much bigger animals that will emerge around here with much bigger eyes. They're the drones, they're the male bees. So the vast majority of the hive is female. You have drone bees that are around at particular points in the season when it's mating time. And of course, one of the things with these animals that's worth remembering is they have to survive over the winter. The way they do that is by storing pollen, nectar in the hive that they then use to feed over the winter. Of course, the majority of the reason we keep honeybees is actually to take the hive and the wax products away from the bees. Um, we're actually not doing that very much because obviously they're hives that we're using for experimental purposes. So what we're able to do, and I should say we work with them in the lab a little bit, but the majority of the time we're trying to monitor them out in the field. And what you'll see in about a few seconds coming up is actually the, the bees trying to deal with the direct threats. So the hypothesis that this work is kind of built on is that you'll be aware, I'm sure, because it's been, again, covered quite extensively, honeybees have not been doing very well, particularly over winter in the UK and in bits of Europe. 
So if you talk to honeybee keepers, we have many of them in this area, one of the things that they will report is they lose a lot of their hives over the winter. The bees are dying off. Why they're dying off, we don't really understand. And there are many, many different factors at play. One of them is probably pesticide exposure. One of them is exposure to in a, the lack of forage. So the bees need to go out. They need to have a flower supply that they can harvest from and bring back to the hive. Ah, oh, it's there, okay. Sorry, I just want to show you this little bit. Did you see it? It's, the colour's a bit bad, so it's a bit hard to see. So if you watch very carefully, what you will see is that's a wasp. Oh. So you effectively see the bees coming under attack and of course the wasps will attack the bees because what they will try and do is they'll try and go in and rob the honey. If the bees aren't in a position where they're fit enough, so you can see the wasp walking across the front now. So the wasp is now basically being rough and tumbled by the guard bees that are on, their, their job is really to deal with invaders and what you'll eventually see is in the middle of that tussle is the wasp being turfed out. And they've managed to do it without actually having to sting. So no bee has probably died in the process. They've managed to actually attack it, shunt it back out. Now, you can imagine in a situation where the hive doesn't have enough guard bees, isn't well enough maintained, that they would be vulnerable to that attack. And we actually had a hive this year, fairly close to this one, that was completely stripped out by wasps over the space of a weekend. Because they come in, the second they get access, they just go in, clean it out kill the bees off and the bees will just leave the hive because they can't protect themselves. So you lose hives quite quickly uh, when you have wasp attacks. We had quite a lot of wasps around. So what are we actually trying to do and what are we trying to get at? Okay. The way a bee sees the world is a little bit different to us, and this is where some of the chemistry is worth thinking about. So we might see a flower meadow pretty much like that. Now, bees, for a start, see in UV, and I'm not so worried about that bit, but the other thing that they effectively interact with and that they rely on on a daily basis are is the chemistry of the flowers that they have to go out and forage from. So it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to imagine if you have pollutants around, chemicals around that are mixing with those flower volatiles. The question is, does that in some way impair the ability of the bee to be able to find useful flowers to forage on? That's one thing, so straightforwardly at finding them. The other thing that's also worth bearing in mind is these animals have to learn the volatile of the flower that they want to go and forage from. So if you imagine going out, seeing different flowers like that, it would take you a while to home in on a particular flower type visually. They have to do that on the basis of some visual cues, but very much the olfactory cues, so the smells or the volatiles that the flower emits. So any chemistry that alters that, or that alters the actual way in which the bee itself perceives the smell, so effectively its nose, if you like, and its um, olfactory processing system, is going to impair this ability of the animal to operate effectively. And again, to give you a little bit of an idea about that, when bees go and forage, they may well forage up to about eight kilometer flights to foraging sites. So they go out a long way to find the most effective forage to then bring it back. So you want an animal, and as a hive, you want your foragers to be able to go out, find a productive site, bring it back as efficiently, as effectively as possible. Otherwise, the bee itself is likely to start to become compromised. So we started from a very, very controlled system and from something that's, that's economically quite relevant. And all of you will be, be familiar with this particular plant, oilseed rape, you see it. Anybody who drives up and down the M27, there's vast tracts of land around here that are given over to oilseed rape twice a year. They tend to crop twice a year. It's an economically valuable resource. It also is a, a crop that's quite reliant on insect pollination. So insect pollination and the need for the use of bees extends not just to fruits and things that you know, we consume in other ways, almonds, for example. Many of the almonds that we get in this country will have come from places where all of those almonds will have been pollinated by honeybees. The honeybees that carry out that pollination are moved to those sites just for a period of pollination. They're then put back on trucks. They're driven to another site. They may be released into, um, I don't know, it could be other almond orchards or some other crop. So the bees are being moved 
this happens in this country too. Bees get moved all along the south coast, up across to Devon for um, crops and uh, apples and things down there, and then across to Kent. Bees are trucked backwards and forwards. So they're not just stationary, sitting, you know, having their hives put wherever they are. Some of them are used and managed in that way, as opposed to smaller beekeepers. So one of the nice things about oilseed rape is we know its volatile profile. So we know the chemistry of the flower smell very well. It's been very well characterized and we can synthesize it in the lab. We also know that if you have oilseed rape where you don't have good pollination going on by insects and in particular bees, the crop yield goes down. So you will still have oilseed rape coming through. You'll still be able to harvest from it, but your yield will be much lower. So there's a need to make sure that we maintain um, effective pollination services. So. Our hypothesis is very, very simple, and that is that a bee having to find the chemistry of its food source, in this case, and as a byproduct of that, carry out pollination of these flowers, may be impacted on by the chemistry of uh, airborne pollutants, including vehicle exhausts. Now, we focused on diesel exhaust in particular because we are interested in both the gaseous component and the particulate component. And I'm going to focus mainly on the gaseous element today in contrast to Matt's work. So what you're looking at here is effectively the bee trying to find this chemical signature of these flowers in the context of um, pollution laid over the top of it. So we carry out a technique. Oh, actually, no, I should say, we, we, all of the stuff that we do is, d is done in quite a controlled environment. We're not just harvesting plants from roadsides. We have greenhouses that we can grow, grow oilseed rape in on the roof of Building 85. We have our very own pollution source here, ably manned by Dr. Girling, who was one of the um, postdoctoral fellows working on this project. And what we have is we have generators both on our Chilworth site and down at our Highfield site. In conjunction with that, we then have two different exposure systems. And again, one of the questions that was touched on with Matt was this idea of chronic exposure versus acute exposure. If you think about it, most animals that are living for any length of time will be exposed to repeated fluxes of pollution over the period of their lifetime. And what we're trying to do in a lab situation is look at one, just the very acute responses. So if we do something in a controlled way, do we see a change? And then we're also interested in trying to mimic more what might go on if your hive is situated near a roadway or if the animals are foraging near roadways, motorways. Again, if you think of the geography of this area, there are many hives that are quite close to major roadways. So in conjunction with that, what we're then able to do is use various analytical techniques. And this is gas, chrom gra gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, and at its simplest, what it enables you to do is it enables you to determine the chemical makeup of the volatiles that you're looking at and to see then you can look at them. In this case, you're looking at the profile just in clean air. So this is just the normal mix of oilseed rape. Sorry, just go back one. So what we've done is we've taken the main constituents that are recognized to make up oilseed rape in their relative ratios, and we just run them through the, through the mass spec machine, and you get this profile here. If we then take that same mix and we expose it to diesel exhaust in a lab setting, what you see, and it's a bit hard to see on this background, but what you can see here is we effectively lose these two peaks here. So we lose what's called alpha terpenine, and we lose the alpha farnesine component. So what we wanted to know was this was interesting because this showed that actually straightforwardly diesel exhaust alters the chemistry of the flower volatile, which was an interesting finding. What we then really wanted to know was, does that actually have any consequence to a bee? So can a bee, so if you think back, a bee realizes a flower is a good place to go. It learns the smell of that flower. So if we train a bee to the smell of that flower and we then train it to the smell of a flower effectively that's altered because it's been exposed to diesel exhaust, can the bee find it as effectively? That's really what we want to set up. And one of the nice things with bees is you can teach them to learn an incredibly broad range of smells. So they've been used, they've been trained to do things like try to recognize landmines, for example, because they have a particular volatile signature that the bee can be trained to spot and then the bee will then fly to it uh, if, if it spots that volatile signature in its environment. And we do that really, all of you I'm sure are probably familiar with the idea of Pavlov's dog. So the idea with the dog experiment was eventually you got to the point where if you just rang the bell, the dog would salivate. We can effectively do the same thing with the bee, only what we do is we get the bee to stick its tongue out. So if we 
It's a little undignified, but if we strap them into little tubes so that their front legs are sticking out, their head's free and then their antenna are free, what we can then do is offer the smell to them in a very controlled way, so the odour of our plant is flowed very gently over the top of the bee. At the same time, so bees are very, very sugar-centric. They care about sucrose. When they're going out looking for nectar, effectively, one of the things they're looking for is the sugars to bring back into the hive. If you expose them to these two things at the same time, the bee's response will be to stick out its proboscis. What you then do is you give it a reward by actually giving it some sucrose directly onto its proboscis. Okay? So we set up arrays of these, expose them to all sorts of different conditions. Eventually you get to the point where the tongue, uh, where the bee, just in response to the odour being passed over it, will stick its proboscis out because it's now anticipating a reward. So we go through these learning trials with the bees. The majority of bees will learn very quickly, two or three trials, and you get very robust responses where between 95 97% of your bees will unequivocally respond to that learnt odour. And they retain it. If you keep them over another couple of days, which is about as long as we can keep them in a lab condition, they will remember that odour that they've learnt. So what we then wanted to do was see, OK, so just to give you an idea of what they really look like. So this is a bee with its proboscis in. This is a bee anticipating a reward, so it's got its proboscis out. So with the particular strain of bee we use, this would be how they would reach down into the flower to pull the nectar out. And in essence, this result here shows you that if we take out one component, so the alpha farnesine that was affected by the diesel, we see a drop in response from 100% of our control bees down to about 75%. If we take out the alpha terpenine, we see an even bigger reduction. And then the two of them are both taken out of that mix. So the two that were depleted by the exposure to the diesel exhaust, we end up with bees only managing to recognise the, and respond to the odour about 27 to 30% of the time. So this shows you that altering the chemistry from what they've learnt to then what they're exposed to affects their ability to be able to find it. So that's great from the, the environment the bee operates within, so the bee finding the flower. I'm a, a neuroimmunologist. I'm more interested really in what's going on in the bee itself. So bees have to learn, so they need effective learning in memory. Might it be that one of the things that's happening in parallel is that the diesel exhaust is directly impacting on the machinery of smell that the animal has? So what you're looking at here is an electron micrograph of the head of a bee. So this is just a bee sitting in the microscope. Now, the bee's nose is effectively distributed along this, these antennae. So it has a pair of these antennae sticking out the front of its head. That is how they orientate themselves in a kind of chemical world, if you like. And the, there are many different receptors that are responsive to um, different chemistries. At much, much higher magnification, so if we just home in on one tiny speck on here, what you can then see, these are the actual olfactory receptors. Now, these are very well studied. Some of what we know about olfaction has been learned studying these kind of systems. And we now are starting to understand at quite a detailed level the chemistry of the proteins that you find in these olfactory receptors. So, of course, that's just the antennae. For the bee to learn and to retain memory, it has to um, effectively use its central nervous system to store the memories that it's, that it's starting to build up. So if you go another level and you look inside one of these olfactory receptors, what you have, as well as the actual sensor that picks up the chemical, you also have the neurons here, so that's an olfactory receptor neuron, that then runs right the way down into the antennal lobe of the bee. So they're beautifully organised, and what you're looking at in these bright green regions here are actual glial cells. So we all have glial cells in our central nervous system that are responsible for helping maintain the health of our neurons. And we know from studies on humans, on rodents, that disruption to your glial cells it can tell you two things. It can tell you that your neurons are probably not doing as well as they should do and maybe starting to become impaired. We also know that if your glial cells are affected, they can start to damage your neurons. So what we're now in the process of trying to do, and this is work that's going on in the lab right now, is we're really trying to understand, can we use the response of the glial cells down here, which are sitting, so these neurons would run down into this region here. The glial cells will then be sitting around their processes. So we're trying to see whether or not we can get a handle on 
are the glial cells effectively acting as a reporter of damage or injury for the olfactory receptor neurons in these animals. And this is work that's very much live at the moment in the lab. Both of these bits are, are kind of continuing in the lab at the moment. So what do we conclude? Uh, I should just say, I've talked about diesel. One thing that's worth bearing in mind, and one of the things that we went on to do in terms of trying to find out which bit of the chemistry was causing the problem, if you like, in the context of what was actually affecting the chemistry of the volatiles, it's the NOx component. This is a really highly reactive gaseous mix, and it's quite interesting because if you look around at the moment, with all of the air monitoring that's going on, one of the bits of data that's not probably as broken down as it could be is the detail of how much NOx there is in the environment. We know the total NOx is very high, but the, the different NOxes that you have, the detailed information is not out there. So the regulation on those bits is not as tight as it might be. So I just wanted to touch on the fact that actually petrol produces even more of these NOxes. So people tend to think of petrol as a slightly cleaner fuel because you don't have the particulate component in the same way. The reality is that at least in, in the system that we're looking at, it's probably as problematic. So I hope I've kind of given you an idea that we need to think about airborne pollution beyond just humans directly, although, of course, this impacts on us. If we don't have effective pollination and we don't have crops at the rate that we need them, that is going to have an impact on human health. But Guy is going to pick up on that theme much more. I think we've managed to demonstrate that in our honeybees we, we see impaired learning as a result of exposure to diesel exhaust and that really the reactive, the most reactive bit of the chemistry is this NOx gases component. As I touched on at the beginning, we've chosen to work with bees. We've chosen to work with them because you can get an amazing number of different behavioural readouts by just watching what they do. We, they're very well known. People have worked with honeybees. You know, you can go right back to find texts from the ancient Greeks and some of their bee handling practices. And you know, what they described then in terms of how bees lay down pollen, lay down honey, that hasn't changed. Our bees do exactly the same thing, even if we give them a four, few more mod cons to help them do it. But it is worth bearing in mind that other insects that are not talked about anywhere near as much, things like butterflies, moths, which we think about even less, those same insects, we know there are declines in those insects, but they're not as obvious to us because you haven't got people going to the bottom of their gardens on a daily basis, opening the lid of their hives and going, what's happening to my bees? We don't do that for moths, we don't do it for butterflies, we don't do it for lots of other species. So this really is about thinking in the bigger ecological context. And I should just finish by just saying, so this is Christine, this is uh, the one of the PhD students who's working on the project and she's just taking the data card or actually the battery pack off the little bee counter there. And the other person who has done a lot of the flower volatile work is Dr. Vusebrink. And then we have a couple of graduate students and we've been very, very lucky to actually have a lot of support from uh, Chris Jackson, who's in biological sciences, who is an avid beekeeper and who has very, very good connections with the bigger kind of beekeeping community across Hampshire. So thank you very much. <coughs>